About four years ago now, I was finishing up my last year of university. I was studying a joint honours in creative and professional writing, and one of my final modules was The Written World, which looked at how we can learn things about the people and world around us by the things they write. Unfortunately, I can't find the module handbook, but it was a very free form module with our final piece being anything we wanted that explored the written world. I remember we had lectures that focus on such diverse topics as Taliban poetry and the language of online bullying. It was about the same period of time that I'd started becoming more interested in Old English and the history of the English language. While researching some possibilities for my final piece of writing, I stumbled across the notion of Anglish or Roots English. Anglish, a term coined by author Paul Jennings, is the end result of a movement of linguistic purism in English that opposes foreign influence on the language. English has been the subject of intense external pressures since the Norman conquest of England, having been avoided by the literate ruling classes and looked upon as the language of the common folk, and as such, much of its native vocabulary and grammar has been supplanted by features of Latinate and Greek origin. In its mildest form, purism stipulates the use of native terms instead of loanwords. In stronger forms, new words are coined from Germanic roots, such as wordstock for vocabulary, or revived from older stages of English, such as strife for proceed. Noted purists of early modern English include John Czech and Nathaniel Fairfax. Modern linguist purists include Charles Dickens and George Orwell. So, coming back to my time at uni, I set out to explore how our language has been changed by non-Germanic influencers and I wrote a short horror story in English. I spent dozens of hours painstakingly checking the origin of every single word and translated it to English where necessary. I've put my sources in the description below and if enough people are interested I'll put a link to the short story and the full glossary out there too for you to read at your leisure. So on with the story. This short story is called the unsayedness of the room Hugh White. It had begun with the healer. He had come to the town a month before and started to install himself as a foremost belonger of the fellowship. To me, there was something off about him. He was Arliss. At my fourteenth year of eld, I was chosen to undergo a sight fair that my folk formerly freeled every year hundred. Not long after the healer had reached the town, Gearwings began to once again freel the unsayedness and I was toured for my dework. As the youngest of the eld he kind in the town, on my sixteenth year of eld, I learned my wayfaring in this world would end and I would begin a new life in one akin world as the folkways needed. My troth shattered under the weight of such wildry and my mind became clouded with wonder. I knew I was going to die, and so when it became time for the unsaidness, I kicked, I screamed, and I fought with every thread of my being. My father knew the weird that I was about to be swallowed up in. He held me by the shoulders as the men of the town picked me up and ferried me kicking and screaming to my berth beside the great fire. He was no longer the strong, wise man that, as a child, I had looked to with such awe. Instead, his eyes spoke to me of a meek man, willing to dree his own doom for the sake of his place among his matches. In him, I saw no glimpse of Melee Ethelsing for the deed he took. As the folkway began, women looped the blaze, stepping into the slow beat of a drum. The healer threw handfuls of hallowed dust into the fire as it grew greater, spitting blue and green sparks high into the loft. The women's step grew swift, and as the drum beat reached a peak, the list fell, and all eyes fostered their gaze onto me. It lasted only an eye blink, but it felt everlasting. My father took me by the forehead and held me back. All I could see was the sky as the healer began to yarn the spell that would thwear my pathway. The folk of this town gather to mather the gods of our forebears. We ask that they might bring us bliss and knowledge in the years that come, and in right we offer them this soul as offset, to meet their world and be token as in the land of the holy. As he ended the spell, I felt my life slip away. My head became light as darkness fell on my eyes. Nothingness overcame me, and I felt the cold blade of a knife slide along my outstretched neck. I stepped outside of the world. The yaw of my folk burst before me. Blown men rode blown horses in great gouths, swinging swords at each other, blocking the wild strikes with broad shields. 
I no longer found myself watching from aloft. Instead, I was on the ground among the blown men as they clashed. Two men fought, though they failed to heed my bib. One of the men kicked the other, his blade met with his witherling's neck and lodged itself partway through the bloody flesh. As swiftly as they had come, the men faded. The ground melted away and below me hung a town which I acknowledged as my own. It grew, brick by brick, into a great sprawl that overspread the fallow land around it. Its buildings grew taller and bolder before crumbling back to the earth. Lacking the strength to offshoff, I was twinged to watch, floating in the winds of nothingness, without the might to sway the mishap that took place before me. I reached a hand out to my town, and the flow of time seemed to set back. The crumbled buildings rebuilt themselves, growing tall and grand, then shrinking into simplicity as the image waned away. I felt some heaven may and pull at me, and the setting before me waned quicker as I too was pulled further from the room. As the likeness of my town stopped before me, I felt the darkness grow thick and crushing, and I was eaten up by the nothingness. Some time later, I reawoke. I was no longer in the dark nowhere stead in which I had glimpsed a small thrum of my home's foreshaft. Instead, I had been ferried to some deep cleave so great its walls were shrouded in creeping darkness. I lay in a small riding, rock surrounding me on three sides, and the fourth opened up to a bay that fought out into mistly paths that could be taken to steeds deep within the rock, and likely anywhere within the cleave. I picked myself up from the warm stone floor and cleaned the clingy, dry dirt from my tunic and trousers. I heard the scurry of small feet shadow through the cleave, their owners no wonder keeping their way, yet yielding narrow mind to me, and though I could not see them, I felt reckonless eyes with their gaze locked upon me. I made my way out of the rocky pen with weariness in my heart, taking a sinewsome steps into the bay. From a hollow in the outside wall of my dung, I took a burning wisp made from an unquithingly twisted wood. The wisp burned bright, but it yielded no heat and the wood seemed to be unclouded by the fire's leery feel. With the fire's light feeling as my white, I chose to follow the leftmost path, its dark twists and wends seemingly the furthest from the soulless shadows that looked to offshoot along some unseen path with every step or shift in warning that I took. The path that I had chosen was, in truth, a burrow carved into the thick rock of the cleave wall. Its walls were unevenly cut into the rock neb, besmirched with clusters of scratch-like grooves. When I first came across the scratched rock, I had, like a lifesome child, ran my fingers along the light grooves and was ailed with a far-reaching lathe in the furthest depth of my mind. I was struck down by the lethal raid of my thoughts, and when I lay in the dirt howling in woe, I fanged a harrowing swaven. I had taken the stead of another, a girl no older than myself, and though through the girl's own eyes I could make out no finger bare marks, I knew that she too had undergone the same unsaveness that I had, and now I would uplive what she'd read. I, or rather she, ran through the darkness, hot-footed by the same footsteps that followed me now girl, whoever she was, tripped in the pitch black. Wither earth-born hands with long sharp claws reached out from the dirt-ridden floor and held her tightly to the ground. Through her eyes I saw the shadows shift and warp, melding into a shapeless dread that lunged out from its hiding stead in the darkness. The hands loosened their grip and the girl took her luck. Instead of flight, she could find only hard wall blocking her path. The shadow hue signalled its woeth. It reached out from the blackness once again, taking an unyielding grip of the girl's leg. It pulled. Hard. The girl lost her steady and fell onto the floor. She reached out, hope yearning for something to grip onto. Dirt poured through her fingers as every trucked bid to burg her life dived her further into a sea of forethought. The shadow's grip tightened, pulling her toward the darkness. She reached out again in a last cunning to overlive the unbosomed, and for an eye blink her bedreads answered. Her fingertips now gripped a small jut from the rocky wall. The dark thrack pulled again, and her grip struggled against the dothmite. Again it pulled. Her grip trucked, and the shadowy white pulled her into the darkness. The sight waned, but the girl's screams were still steadfast in their hound. Some time later, I came across a mickle set of four old doors carved from the stone wall in which they dwelled. The overwrought doors were decked fulsomely in unwanted tongue, outermostly mizzen to the rooms of my own. 
As I nilatched the door to unlock the writing nearer, the doors opened up to a big room as if they reacted to my vibe. The room was filled with the hushed glow of Ren that poured from an opening in the ceiling. The walls were carved from a mizzen stone that I had seen so far. The hard grey stone of the cleave gave way to brittle, glass-like black rock that gleamed a dull red in the flowsome rock's light. In the heart of the room, there was a great footstone carved from the same glass rock of the room's wall. Resting atop the footstone lay a mickle hearse that seemed as though it belonged there as little as I did. The hearse was swattle, though deep within its kernel flowed a starry night. As I heedfully entered the room, a wraith-like vibe sweetled to white me within reaching breath of the hearse before I had even an opening to react to its hold over my mind. Without thought, I stretched an arm towards the rougher filled athelstone but for an eye blink. As the swift tips of my outstretched fingers neared the hearse, I dithered and became keenly aware that my deeds, since I had first come into the ghastly room, had not been of my own craft. The room drowned in the doomy gleam mist of a thousand fiendish laughs. The black glass walls of room, the tired of forethought to be made of some unquivingly rock, had forthwith was shaped into an overthwart one-way looking glass through which I was now the main interest. The deep black rock had become starred with pairs of boring red wreaths. The eyes of the no-wonder impish whites whose scurrying had trailed me through the cleaves burrows. A stim bellowed from deep within the room of the blackened looking glass. Beneath the laughter speedily ended, leaving only a chilling rue as the impish beasts scampered back into the darkness, fearful of the onsetting orcish vibe. Play, the stim wailed. Die, it boded. At the orc's behest, my fingers fay with the hearse, and forthwith the room around me was no more. I had been ferried somewhere else. The least full wind whittled my chest with a soothing touch that foroded the true wilderness of where I was. The rocky cleave that would have been as an underground dung for the laugh of my days had given way to a freeing openness. Full standing with tall trees that reached high and swaying grass lit blush by the soft twilight sky. It took many thralls for me to fully forgang the stark shift that had been made to my unwares, but only a forthwith. With the foreboding far-off howl of a hungry beast to shatter the brain sheaves that a folk bane is setting. The trees, though indeed tall enough to breach the heavens, were not trees, but instead the towering bones of untold ents and the grass in truth of great fields of hands idly awaiting their fang. I could not offshoot, though I felt no fear in my heart and I had not been ensnared in the grasp of the hand wraiths until the howl of the hungry beast reached my ears once more. This time it was nearer. The words of the onsetting stim shadowed through my mind. Play. Die. The beast would come for me and, if I found myself woeful enough to meet it, then I would dean its next meal. Without dithering I began to run. I ran as fast as I could. The hand race lunging to grasp my legs as I passed them, settled to steed myself as far from the chasing beast as I could. The sun set and dived the bone yard into utter darkness. The beast's howls grew more grim as the twilight righted the night when a sharp cold crept in through the loft. Running from the beast through the endless boneyard left me tired and weak, and I feared I would not last the night. The howls of the beast shadowed through the boneyard. It was closer than it had ever been, and I felt its vibe linger nearby. I picked up one of the many broken bones that besmirched the ground. It was long, slender, with sharp, jagged edge, and though I knew it may do little to throttle my doom, I found myself stiff that the beast would not take me without withering. Another howl. A few eye blinks later, the beast was upon me. It stood stock still, an animal builded of shadow, its hue unsteady and simply shifting on the wants of the wind. I rushed, striking the shadowy hue of the wide hack from my makeshift weapon. The white simply melted into the darkness, but its by blib. Play, called out the white. I righted heedful of a raid by the beast when out of sight, and the white melted before me. I acknowledged its shape. I had seen it before. Its hue grew in speck mark, and it became swattled to me where I had seen the white's likeness before. The healer, who toured me for this ordeal, took a shadowy step towards me. A large grin besmeared across his neb. Die, the beast yelled, lunging forward in a shadowy shroud. Okay, so there we have it. That was the unsaidness of the room Hugh White. 
uh, a short story written by myself in old english anglish this kind of mixture of modern english words that have a germanic origin of old english words of borrowed germanic german high german high norse old norse uh, words to kind of create this pseudo language um and I hope it was as interesting to you as it was to me and that you saw in it the kind of same poetic and musical language that I saw. I would love to talk more about writing and language on this channel. So if you've enjoyed this video, if you've liked what you've heard, if you'd like me to do more about English, more about writing and storytelling, then drop a like, subscribe to the channel, all that jazz. I've got some a Twitch stream, Arctic Anomaly, where I play video games and talk about lore and story for those games and we discuss kind of the writing process and things like that and create our own little stories for some games as well and if that's been interesting to you like I say drop a like follow all that jazz and thank you very very much for watching my first proper serious YouTube video